Good evening and welcome back to our Wednesday evening Bible study at the Farmington Church of Christ. This is our 12th week uh, in our 13 week study of the Epistles of John. I hope that you have been able to follow along thus far. I hope that you have learned something from this study and I hope that you have been encouraged by John's words. We spent the majority of our time in the first epistle of John and last week Tyler dedicated a study to 2 John. This week we are going to be looking at the third epistle that John wrote. If we were going to title uh, tonight's lesson based on our walking theme, it would be Walking in Faithfulness. Maybe a better title though would be Receiving Faithful Brethren. Just a little background here, and it's going to be very similar background to the other epistles. The Apostle John is writing later in his life, uh, probably from the town of Ephesus and probably around AD 90. The purpose of this particular epistle seems to be to commend and to encourage a fellow believer. A lot of different epistles throughout the New Testament, if you look at them, involve some sort of encouragement. And I think that we can learn a lot from this idea. Simple encouragement is what helps us continue to work and to not grow weary while trying to do good. So think about how often do you encourage a brother or sister uh, when you see them standing firm in faithfulness. I think that sometimes we are better at pointing out faults and maybe there's a a time and a place for this than we are encouraging one another. And maybe it's because faithfulness is something that we just expect Christians to be practicing. I've been encouraged by many of you during the process of just teaching this class. Uh, I've received text messages and emails and kind words in person, and I want to thank you for the encouragement that, that you've given me. And as we read this letter of encouragement, and I'm not, I don't think this is necessarily the main point of this particular letter, but think about how you can encourage the way that John did in this letter. Third John, let's read the first verse together. The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. So the author identifies himself as the elder. That's the same as what we saw last week in 2 John. And presumably, the first people reading this letter knew who this was. And from the earliest times, Christians have understood this to be the Apostle John writing. Why did he use the term elder? We don't know exactly. Uh, he, it could have been due to the threat, possibly, of persecution, making direct reference to uh, to himself, unwise and maybe just unnecessary. Uh, it also is reasonable to say that John was just speaking of himself uh, as an older person, as a more mature Christian speaking to those younger in the faith. It is hard to pinpoint who Gaius is. We see Gaius of Macedonia was with Paul during his during the riot in Ephesus. That's in Acts 19, 29. We see Gaius of Derby, who took the collection of money to the poor in Jerusalem. That's in Acts 20 and verse 4. And we also see the, that uh, Gaius of Corinth, baptized by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1. It is impossible to know which one of these is the Gaius that John is writing to in this epistle. It was a common name in the first century even, so there's a really good chance that this particular Gaius was not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament, and this is the first time that we see this Gaius. We also don't even know the name or the city of the church that Gaius attended and worshipped at. This lack of knowledge of details, it doesn't change the message. And we talked about a lot about that a lot when we went through our study of the Bible and we went through each book and sometimes we just ran into situations where we didn't know all the background and the important part was it didn't change the message 
And so the lack of these small details doesn't change the message for us tonight. We read here in verse 1 that John loved Gaius in the truth. Isn't it great how fellow believers are connected via the truth of God's word and are bound together in love by this truth? Have you ever felt connected to other Christians without knowing them? I'm not saying this is necessarily the case with John and Gaius because there's definitely, you can tell that they have a friendship and they've known each other uh, in the past, but they don't seem to be together on a regular basis anyway, or John wouldn't be writing him this letter. And John still has this deep love for Gaius. And really, this is John living out what we've been talking about, especially all the times we talked about love in the first epistle of John. I think back to when I was younger. We used to travel all over creation for sports. It mainly seemed to be on the weekends, and my parents sacrificed a lot for me and my brother to be at these sporting events. But we would always find a service that we could make at a local congregation on Sunday. Even if I was wearing my baseball or basketball or soccer jersey because I had a game right after, we still found a way to attend, and my parents did that for us. Looking back on this, it was really neat how we could do this and how we could feel a connection, we could feel a love to a body of believers that we knew nothing about. And I didn't obviously appreciate this as a kid, but looking back on it, uh, it really means a lot to me. It was also neat to be at different congregations while we were traveling where we maybe knew a family or two from past experiences and we got to worship and spend time with them. The truth binds us together in love. Let's look at the second verse here in 3 John. Dear friend, I pray you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. John begins the letter with a pretty typical format of this wish for good health. His wording, however, is a little unique. First off, he uses the word beloved. We talked about this word a lot in 1 John and how it was often used for this deep relationship, maybe between a husband and a wife. It indicates a closeness of relationship and definitely is a term of endearment that John is using here. Secondly, this is not just your typical well wish, but it is a prayer for wellness in both the physical and the spiritual sense. How encouraging is it to know that fellow believers are praying for you? The practice of praying for physical and spiritual health of other believers is something that I think we need to be reminded of. I do think we do a pretty good job of this in our formal settings, but my guess is that we could do individually and personally a little bit better. Maybe we need to keep some lists and write some things down to remind us to do these things. John's statement here is really profound because he prayed, if you read it again, that Gaius, that his physical health would match the health of his spirit. Now, obviously, John recognized Gaius' strength spiritually, and he knew that this would be a blessing that he was praying for. But it does beg the question for us, I think, would this prayer be a curse for our physical health? If someone was to pray for you, for your physical health to match your spiritual health? Food for thought. John loved Gaius. He prayed for him. He wanted him to prosper. This is a blueprint for us on how to treat the brethren. John absolutely follows what he's been preaching. Let's look at verses 3 and 4 in our text. 
It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. Evidently, some faithful members of the congregation had a visit with John. This was probably to discuss the issues going on at that church, at that congregation. And this letter seems to be the result of what John learned during this visit. These members spoke highly of Gaius and his faithfulness. And John wanted to Ga Gaius to know how much joy that brought him. Do we look for brethren who continue in faithfulness in the truth? Maybe they have overcome a tough situation where they could have left the faith, but they stuck with it. Or maybe they are just making faithful decisions or living a faithful lifestyle uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's have eyes for the faithful and continue to encourage those who are doing good. Everyone needs encouragement, not just those who appear to be struggling all the time. When we do see the faithful, do we find joy in it? Or do we just see it as Christians doing what they're supposed to do? As a man manager of people, I have expectations for my employees. When they meet them or when they exceed these expectations, I find joy in it. And I let them know. Sure, they are simply just doing their job, but they are doing it well. And because of that, they are making my job easier. And as a manager, it would be toxic to see these good actions and to not commend them for it. Same goes for us as Christians. If we see faithfulness, we should be filled with joy and we should continue to encourage that faithfulness. John had no greater joy than to see his children walking in the truth, he says. His children seemed to mean fellow brethren, especially those who maybe he had converted, maybe he had taught at some point. What do we want for our own children when we think about it? Most people would say, if I could have one thing, it would just be for them to be faithful, right? Do we care about other Christians like they are our children, like John did here with Gaius? Let's move on, verses 5 through 8. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers and sisters, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. The faithfulness of Gaius that we read here was seen in his hospitality to the brethren, specifically to those who were traveling, teaching, and preaching the good news of Christ. When we think of hospitality, I think that we often think about inviting people over to our house. Typically, these are people who will eventually return the favor. We have to get this mindset out of our heads because this is not true hospitality. This is a form of fellowship and it's great at certain times, but it is not hospitality. Hospitality is taking care of someone that is not going to pay you back. Uh, and in, in the case of Gaius, this is people that he did not even know, right? So what does it mean when John says to send someone on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Obviously, providing for their immediate needs would be Christ-like. Providing for future expensive expenses. Praying for them. Encouraging them. Jesus set the precedent for supporting evangelists in Matthew 10, 5-15 when he sent his disciples out. Let's turn there real quick and read that. Matthew 10, 5 through 15. These twelve 
Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim the, this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not go... Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay in their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Are we the worthy people who take in travelers and missionaries and, and take care of their needs? Gaius was and is a great example of for us. I was very encouraged to hear about the results from our Mission Sunday and other works that we have going on this time of year specifically, but I do believe that we can do more. Maybe we can look into writing and encouraging these people who we support. I know that some of them have Facebook. We can write them on there, emails, letters, staying in contact with our missionaries. Individually, we could look for needs throughout the year, not specifically one time a year. The only way for us to know these needs, to meet them, is through communication. And we should most certainly be praying for these people and finding joy in their success. John writes that it was for the sake of the name, surely the name of Jesus, that they went out and they did not take money from the pagans. Now this is not a statement that is intended to criticize non-believers, but it is a statement of how things ought to be. It is a little weird, don't you think, to ask support from the soul from the lost souls who you are trying to reach. Maybe your motives could be questioned in this situation. Christians ought to be the ones to show hospitality so we can work together for the truth. The Lord, and we've talked about this, is intimately tied to those who have fellowship with Him. When we serve one another in the body of Christ, we are actually serving the Lord himself. So our faithfulness in caring for the church is an extension of our faithfulness to Christ. Let's move on, verses 9 through 10 of our text in 3 John. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. So John also, in his conversations, has heard about Diotrephes, who is doing the exact opposite of Gaius. He is putting himself first. He is rejecting anything and anyone that does not fit his agenda. In fact, John had already wrote the church, he said. And it seems that Diotrephes had shut this down and he had refused to recognize John's apostolic authority. Diotrephes seems to have gotten power hungry. He liked control. If, you, if we read what Jesus tells the disciples in Mark 10, verses 41 through 45, we see that their leadership will not be about control, will not be about power or authority, but it's going to be about serving others 
and becoming a servant. John had heard that Diotrephes refused to welcome other believers. And he even stops those who wanted to do so. This was Gaius, and this was the situation that he was in. For some reason, this threatened Diotrephes, outsiders coming in. And John told Gaius that he was going to call him out in person when he came. Verses 11 and 12. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Here we see some of John's characteristic, typical language, good versus evil, contrasted. It is imperative that we recognize the difference so that we can imitate good and not evil. So he says good is from God, evil has not seen God. We just had an example of evil, diatrophy, selfish, power hungry, and shut out other brothers and sisters. Now John mentions Demetrius, who was well spoken of by everyone, even the truth itself. See, the truth is John's measuring stick. It helps determine evil and good and what we should be imitating. How does your life measure up to the truth? Is it in line with the truth, like Gaius and Demetrius? Or is it constantly fighting the truth, like Diotrephes? Would the church speak well of you and testify on your behalf as a truth follower? We have decisions that we make every day to seek the good or the evil. And it kind of oversimplifies life a little bit. But maybe that's just it. Are you going to imitate what is good or are you going to imitate what is evil? Romans 12, 21, one of my favorite verses, says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Good always wins out. Good will win out over evil in the end, even if it doesn't look like it in this world. John is urging Gaius and us today to choose good, to remain faithful, even when things are discouraging in life. And for Gaius, the situation of the church probably was very discouraging. But John wants us to choose good, to remain faithful even in these situations. To close out, verses 13 and 14, John says this in his final words of his epistles. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. John tells Gaius that he has a lot more to say in these few verses that he was able to fit into this letter. But he would rather do that in person. And then he closes the letter with personal wishes to his friends. The piece that John mentions here is the Hebrew word shalom. This is more than just a greeting. It is a reminder of the peace that is bestowed upon the people of God. That peace that Paul talks about in Philippians 4 that passes our understanding. And John also wanted his greetings to be very personal. Greet them by name, he says. And this would have been very encouraging to the people. The early Christians were more than acquaintances. They were friends who loved each other, and they knew each other by name. Is there anything better, is there anything more encouraging and having someone call you by name, call you out, and tell them they love you, and personally encourage you. To wrap things up, Second John, we see John emphasize the need to refuse hospitality 
to false teachers. And Tyler talked about that last week. And as we've gone through the letter of 3 John, we see that John is now urging continued hospitality to those who teach the truth. John wants that love that he has been pushing for, that he has been preaching, that we read in the first epistle, to be shown to all believers. Don't limit this love that is from God. I hope that you have been encouraged by John's words. We look forward to meeting with you one last time next week as we look at and wrap up the entire epistles of John. And Bob will be doing that for us. So please look forward to that and attend next week.